In March 1833, Whittier received letter from Garrison that summoned him to action. My brother, there are upwards of two million of our countrymen who are doomed to the most horrible servitude which ever cursed our race and blackened the page of history. Whittier, enlist. Your talents, zeal, influence are all needed. Whittier obeyed and found in this new service to humanity not only the inspiration which made him a genuine poet, but popular recognition that led to fame. While it declined in the post-revolutionary period, there were still slaves in New England on the eve of the Civil War. New England boats made more than half of all the North American voyages that brought nearly a quarter of a million Africans to the New World. Although the United States Congress outlawed the slave trade in 1807, slaving voyages to Africa by New England boats took place illegally until at least 1821. In 1831, William Lloyd Garrison launched a newspaper in Boston, The Liberator, calling for his immediate emancipation of all slaves. Two years later, the American Anti-Slavery Society was formed in Philadelphia, led by Garrison, with Whittier serving as clerk of the convention. This strengthened white New Englanders' anti-slavery attitudes and anti-slavery societies were formed. There was equal participation by the free black community who actively teamed up with white abolitionists and with their own constituents organized together to denounce slavery. To be an abolitionist was no easy task. For Whittier, the cost of obedience to his conscience was heavy. Churches, colleges, and courts were against the abolitionists because the latter were considered dangerous members of society. Abolitionists preached anarchy in the name of humanity. Whittier, trained to quiet activism, non-resistance, and respect for the law, and skilled as he had become, in feeling the pulse of public opinion, knew perfectly well what company he was henceforth to keep. To be an active abolitionist was to join the outcasts. Whittier's first act of allegiance was to publish at his own expense a pamphlet, Justice and Expedience, which pleaded for emancipation by peaceful means. In Devotion to Cause of the Slave, Whittier wrote, I am not insensible to literary reputation. I love, perhaps too well, the praise and goodwill of my fellow man. But I set a higher value on my name, as appended to the Anti-Slavery Declaration of 1833, than on the title page of any book. Amesbury had its own anti-slavery cause for Negro emancipation. Only one phase of the struggle for a wider human freedom everywhere that stirred and deepened Whittier's whole nature. His poetry was prolific during this time. Slave poems, national causes, and political themes. On March 3rd, 1828, Whittier arrived in Philadelphia as the new editor of the newspaper Pennsylvania Freeman. Subsequent events in Philadelphia were to create another turning point in Whittier's life. He wrote a poem for the dedication of the newly built Pennsylvania Hall, where his offices were located. The hall was built to provide a venue for anti-slavery discussion. 
two days of anti-slavery meetings passed without trouble. Rumors began to spread that there was intermingling of Negroes and whites. Whittier was on the platform, listening to former slave owner turned abolitionist Angelina Grimke speak when stones pelted against the windows. Unrest began in earnest, and Negroes leaving the meeting faced threats of assault. The mayor arrived and said he couldn't protect the hall unless the keys were placed in his hands. He then addressed the crowd, who answered him with jeers and refused to disperse. At about eight o'clock, the work of destruction began in the midst of assembled thousands. The doors were broken open with axes, the anti-slavery office in the lower story was entered, and books and pamphlets scattered about the crowd. Soon the cry of fire was heard, and flames appeared from the building. The flames soon rose high above the roof, casting baleful light upon the busy incendiaries, and the immense crowd of people stood, gazing at the scene. Whittier went out in the crowd in disguise to hear them clamoring for, Whittier, hang him! He joined in the shout and passed safely through the crowd. The next morning, Whittier took part in an adjourned business meeting of the convention, held in the street in front of the smoking ruin of Pennsylvania Hall. William Lloyd Garrison left Philadelphia at midnight and had gone to Bristol, 20 miles away from Philadelphia, and the mob. This was the third time that Whittier had faced danger in his abolitionist work. Discouraged, probably scared, and certainly suffering from poor health, he returns to Amesbury. He was suffering from insomnia, blinding headaches, and chest pains. By 1840, the American Anti-Slavery Society became fractured over Garrison's insistence on women's rights and rejection of political strategies. Whittier wanted to abandon the women's rights piece and focus just on the abolition of slavery so he politically broke with his old friend and mentor Garrison at that time. From 1840 on, Whittier drew what he believed were safe boundaries around his life, avoiding situations and emotions which would bring on episodes of excruciating pain. When his doctor advised him to avoid travel, he turned to the safety of his Amesbury home giving up a measure of freedom for a measure of health and the security to write. Amesbury was experiencing the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution and mills were being built for manufacturing. The street in front of the Whittier House, Friend Street, was one of the main thoroughfares for commerce. While the farm was isolated, now there was plenty of activity for the Whittier family. Between periods of ill health, Whittier was a great worker. From his cottage in Amesbury, he edited two Massachusetts newspapers and as corresponding editor, contributed 275 articles and 109 original poems to the abolitionist National Era. He went on with his political work, helping to elect liberal candidates to the U.S. Senate and opposing in print every government action which might promote slavery. James Fields recognized that Whittier was a tremendous worker whose poetry might have a large public appeal. Fields skillfully began to manage Whittier's career. In 1857, Fields obtained all the copyrights of Whittier's previously published poems. By the 1860s, Whittier was selling poems to the Atlantic Monthly. 